Hello, dangerous people. Imagine a city where nothing goes to waste, where everything we consume, that we use and throw away is a resource that we can use again. Cities are full of resources, people, infrastructures, institutions, wastewater, rain, urban agriculture, green infrastructures, cooking oil, solid waste, even plastic waste. All of these are very valuable resources that we can use. If we start to rethink cities, we might find that a waste in one sector can be a resource in another sector. If we start thinking of cities that way, we can say that we're talking about a water, energy, food nexus. That sounds really academic, doesn't it? But actually, a nexus just means connecting things, linking things together. If we start to think of cities that way, we could even think of them as being regenerative. Cities can produce a lot of resources that we can use to regenerate entire regions. For example, wastewater. It's a source of nutrients, as is organic waste. We can extract these and put them to regions in rural areas to improve crop yield. It's been shown that this works. Or to improve soil health, to support biodiversity. And such a city can help to regenerate ecosystem functions in much larger scales. Could such a regenerative, circular nexus city, or nexus city for short, be the city of our dreams? Today, we use a lot of resources only once. Water, energy, and food, we treat them as single-use resources that we consume, and then we throw them out, creating waste and environmental pollution. There seems to be no sustainable way of dealing with that waste. All the stuff that we buy at a discount, a plate made of porcelain that costs 50 cents, that cannot be the true cost of the plate. Someone else is paying for those externalities maybe through water and air pollution, perhaps in China. And as climate change is showing us, the very high level of resource consumption that we have is simply too much for our planet. Let's take water as an example. Have you had a glass of water today or taken a shower? If so, raise your hand. Oh, good. <laughs> Where does all that water come from? In Munich, drinking water flows from our taps whenever we turn the tap on. We use that water for drinking, of course, but we also use that drinking water to wash our dishes, to wash our clothes, to wash the car, to irrigate our garden, to flush the toilet. An average person in Munich uses more than 100 liters of day of water per day. That's a whole bathtub full of water. When we know that we can live quite healthy lives with less, with half of that, and in fact, most people in the world use a lot less water even than that. One third of that drinking water that we use, we use just to flush the toilet. Once we flush the water down the toilet and it goes down the sink, that water is channeled to the outskirts of the city and treated at a central wastewater treatment plant. And that takes a lot of energy before it can be released back to the environment. In Munich, our drinking water flows from the Alps. By gravity, we hardly need energy to supply it. And it's even already drinking water quality so we don't need to treat it much either. But in a lot of cities in the world, supplying water is very energy intensive. In a lot of cities, 
Water has to be brought to the city from far away, transported over long distances. That takes a lot of energy to pump the water. It also takes a lot of energy to build the infrastructure that's needed to do that, like piping, canals. In some cities in the world, the water that's available in the region may even exceed supply. For example, in Las Vegas, in the United States, or Lahore in Pakistan. So, that's very energy intensive to supply water. A lot of cities also need to source their water from groundwater aquifers. And in some cities, the groundwater aquifer may be hundreds of meters below ground. You can imagine, again, that takes a lot of energy. When we use more water than we need in cities, we may be also taking away this water from other agricultural, uh, <clears throat> other productive uses, like agricultural irrigation, for example. And when we do that, rural areas may also need to procure water from further away or from deeper down in the groundwater in order to supply our food. And if we can't grow the food that we need in cities, around cities, in rural areas, then we have to import our food from further away as well. And again, that costs us a lot of energy. So now we know that water energy and food are linked. But how can we use that to make solutions to tackle our challenges like climate change? If we think of these material flows as being linked, we're talking about the water energy food nexus. But in conventional planning, most cities don't think of planning sectors together. They plan them separately in silos, and that creates a lot of resource use inefficiencies. That creates a lot of inefficiencies, particularly in terms of using water and energy, and that in turn creates a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So that's one reason why cities have such high greenhouse gas emissions. Our infrastructure systems, were designed at a time when we didn't have a concept about resources on our planet being limited. They were designed at a time when we didn't know what the consequences would be. These infrastructure systems are designed to use a lot of water and energy. They are designed in a linear way to use resources once, to create waste, and then to dispose of it out of sight, out of our sight. And that costs a lot of energy and creates environmental pollution. These externalities at the moment are not factored into our economic growth in conventional economic theory. They don't figure in our GDP. But once they start to do, we will see that these costs that can be prevented are a huge burden to us, the taxpayers. So yet, let's make use of an interesting fact. In a city like Munich, the sewerage system is over 100 years old. It's very old, and so it's in need of expensive repairs. And a city like Munich is having trouble figuring out how they're going to pay for these expensive repairs. It's difficult to afford. So it's an excellent time to reconceptualize our infrastructure systems. You see, we are already repairing them. So why not reinvent them altogether? The opportunity and the time are ripe. But we seem to be stuck in a wealth trap. We seem to be married to our resource-intensive urban infrastructure systems. Rigid institutional structures will tell us that we have what we have, we can't change it, it's too difficult to change. But is that really true? Couldn't we change these systems if we really put our minds to it? It's not that long ago that we thought it would be impossible to go to the moon. And then we, we made it. We can evolve. 
We can adapt, we can change everything that we have for the better, including our resource-intensive infrastructure systems. But now it's up to us to act and to do it quickly. So how can we transition? If we start planning sectors in a nexus manner, it can make our resource consumption a lot more efficient. Waste in one sector could be a resource in another, like I said before. For example, wastewater. Wastewater is 99.9% .9 water. If we treat it in a suitable way, we can reuse it, in theory, countless times. We can reuse it for drinking. We can use it to water the garden, to wash our dishes, to wash the car, to water the green infrastructure, even to flush the toilet. Cities like Singapore or Windhoek in Namibia have been doing this for decades already because they're in water-scarce regions. The city of Schweinfurt in northern Bavaria has just started doing this as well due to local climate change-induced drought conditions. Wastewater also inherently contains a lot of energy. We can harvest methane from sewage and from organic waste, and that can also be a very significant source of renewable energies. It's also a great way to harvest a very potent clim climate change um, greenhouse gas because methane is 25 times more potent than CO2. And you may not know this, but methane emissions may be as much as half of all of the greenhouse gas emissions in some cities. Crazy, isn't it? And there are many more potentials that we can think of that cities have. We could harvest rain. We could grow fruit and vegetables in urban agriculture. We can harvest nutrients. Green infrastructures could be carbon sinks. They could be hubs of biodiversity. And all of these opportunities are opportunities to create jobs. So let's go back to that nexus city of our dreams, where all the resources, or as many as possible of them, are locally harvested and reused, and the concept of waste no longer exists, all of the resources have an appropriate market value to enable their harnessing and their capture, and this will create a lot of green jobs. This can help cities to become more self-sustained, thereby lowering their carbon footprints. What would such a nexus city look like in Munich? Remember that cooking oil I talked about at the beginning? We could use that. Together with sewage and organic wastes, we could create clean fuel for public transport, for example. That's why my team and I are thinking about what we could do with organic waste, how we can capture it and harness it. Can we conceive of capturing wastewater decentrally in a city like Munich, capturing it from buildings, turning it into energy. I wonder, how much energy would we be able to produce? I'm curious to find that out. What about all the rain that falls in the winter? If we stop driving so many cars, would underground parking be a space where we could start collecting rainwater and then we could use it in dry seasons? like now, so that the grass doesn't turn brown? What about all the nutrients? How many could we harvest? How many fruit and vegetable could we actually grow if we cover all horizontal and vertical surfaces in a city like Munich? Could that be a way of supplying healthy food in a more equitable manner to urban populations? How far can we go to turn cities into powerhouses as resource producers and not just consumers. What do you think? 
Finally, let's ask ourselves very seriously, as the inhabitants of this nexus city, do we really need to consume as many resources as we do? Couldn't we live quite comfortably if we consume less water? For example, and energy? In a city like Munich, people like us, we could cut greenhouse gas emissions quite comfortably, quite easily, if we tried, maybe even by 50%. Couldn't we live quite comfortably if we turn down the thermostats in the winter by a few degrees? If we leave the car parked half of the time? If we limit our international air travel? What would our lives look like if we had a carbon footprint of only two tons per person per year and not eight, as we do at the moment? That's something that would work with our planet. So now we're really dangerous, because now we are aware. If we stop wasting so many resources, our economies will also be doing a lot better. But government and scientists seem to be stuck, each of them waiting for the others to take the lead. They will tell us that we need so much money and time to fix this problem. But I would say, we don't have money, and we've run out of time. So let's do something else. Let's empower our politicians, our decision makers, to take the right choices, make the right decisions. There is a very simple way of decarbonizing the heating system of a university like ours. Let's switch it off at least until we have a better solution. Let's wear a sweater. Why wait? Let's act now. We've done the hard part already. The hard part was reimagining cities. Now we can start reimagining ourselves. <laughs>